Our scripture reading today comes from Matthew 9, verses 27 through 33, and I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, crying loudly, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? And they said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, let it be done to you. And their eyes were opened. Then Jesus sternly ordered them, See that no one knows of this. But they went away and spread the news about him throughout the district. After they had gone away, a demoniac who was mute was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the one who had been mute spoke. And the crowds were amazed and said, never has anything like this been seen in Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I have a question for you. What is the story you need to tell? What is the story that, that you have to tell? When I was a pastor in New York State, right down the street, a couple houses down from the street, uh, the, the Orthodox, the local Orthodox priest, uh, his home was there. And I knew him from clergy group and, and, and saw him a lot since he was a neighbor to the church and was a, he was a really nice guy and, and I loved talking with him. And so you would talk with him often. And he had grown up in an evangelical Bible church setting. And in his 30s, converted to Eastern Orthodoxy and became a, an Orthodox priest. Now, that's quite a journey. And I was always fascinated like that. How, do, how does someone go from the, the Baptist Bible Church to, to the Orthodox Church with the, the incense and, and the icons and, and all of that? Uh, but, but that was the journey that he made. And the thing was, though, whenever I would talk with him, he couldn't help but tell that story. I mean, we'd be talking about anything, and he was a super nice guy and fun to talk with, and we'd be talking about football or how the Buffalo Bills were going to do that Sunday, and, and eventually somehow the conversation shifted to where he was talking about how he had become an Orthodox priest, and, and I would think, now, now wait a minute, I thought we were talking about how the Bills were going to do this Sunday, and, and now we're on to this, but I realized eventually after knowing him a while, I realized he couldn't help but talk about it. I mean, that story was so important to him that he had to talk about it. It was his story, and he had to share it. Well, what about you? What's the story you need to tell? Now, here in the, in the series, we've been talking about healing stories and, and this being a season of healing for us. And so we've been focusing upon these stories of Jesus offering healing, that when Jesus would meet disease in this world, that he would, he would bring healing, wholeness. He would bring life. And so one of the things that's unique about or, or that's not unique about these healing stories is many times that Jesus would say after he'd healed someone, he'd say, don't tell anyone about this. They say, tell no one. Now, there are a lot of reasons why people think that, that he would say that, where, where he would say, don't tell anyone about what I've just done to you, for you. In the Gospel of Mark, which, which we did not read here today, we read from Matthew, but in the Gospel of Mark, there's this, this whole concept as you read through Mark of the messianic secret, like it's the, the fact that Jesus is the Messiah is sort of a secret that, that, uh, that is not revealed right away. But, you know, we the reader know it, but, but those around Jesus don't quite know it yet. Here in Matthew, as, as Matthew is telling this story, my New Testament professor thinks that maybe uh, Matthew shares this as an example of not following the words of Jesus. You know, like where Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, if anyone hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, they're like the builder who built on the rock. And, and my New Testament professor thinks maybe Matthew shares this as an example of someone not doing what Jesus asked. Some say, you know, just practically, maybe Jesus didn't want to create a spectacle. And he said, you know, don't, don't tell anyone. I mean, there's, there's a, lot of, uh, a lot of reasons why Jesus might have said this. But here in this story, these two men who are blind, visually impaired, they call out to Jesus. They follow Jesus. I mean, these are, these are not helpless people. I mean, they're, 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 they're really reaching out for Jesus' help. 
And Jesus asks you, okay, do you think I can do this? And they say, yes, yes. And so Jesus offers what they want and he heals them. And then he tells them, don't tell anyone. Last week, I, I talked about this whole notion of going home. Like, is, isn't faith ultimately about spiritually coming home? And, and as I talked about that, I thought through the week about a Christmas where I went home. The Christmas time was, was when I was in seminary in Texas. It had to have been, I was thinking up, it had to have been about 1997, my best guess. And I drove from Fort Worth, Texas to my home in Missouri, a little west of St. Louis. Now, back in those days, I was younger and I was a little more ambitious in how, how many miles I would put in a, in a day of driving. And that was, I remember, about 11 and a half hours uh, of driving time. And I used to do that in a day. Uh, like I said, I was younger and more ambitious. These days, I'd probably do that in two days. But what I did was I got up early in the morning and left out at, I don't know, eight in the morning or so, drove all day finally made it back to my, to my parents' home in the evening that night. And after driving all day to come home for Christmas, I got there and no one was there. The house was dark and empty. Now I had a key and I could let myself in, but the reason the house was dark and empty was because my mom was sick. Now, I've talked about this before, and I, I've shared my mom's story with you before. My mom had a, a bone marrow cancer called multiple myeloma, was uh, sick for uh, about five and a half, six years uh, before she passed away in the year 2000. And she had periods where she was in the hospital for a long time. And this was one of those times that she was in the hospital and she went to the big deal hospital in downtown St. Louis. And the reason no one was at home when I got home was uh, my dad was there spending the, the evening with my mom. Now that's quite a feeling though, to come home for Christmas and to meet an empty house. Well, later in the evening, my dad made it there. And, but I remember that it was a different Christmas. Uh, Christmas Eve day, I spent there at the hospital with my mom and I saw the hospital grow quiet as non-essential people went home throughout the day. And before it was just the skeleton crew that's there on holidays. Christmas day, we all spent there at the hospital with my mom. We had Christmas and Christmas dinner in the hospital cafeteria. We opened Christmas presents in my mom's uh, hospital room, I think a couple of days after Christmas is when we did that. Now she eventually got out of the hospital and had some better times. She also had some worse times. That was just kind of how those years were. And she passed away uh, three years after that. But I remember that time. And I think about that Christmas a lot that Christmas spent hanging around a hospital. And part of me wants to tell the story of that time, not as a, a woe is me kind of story. I mean, that was a long time ago and, and I've moved past that time. But, but I want to tell that story as a way because as different and as challenging as that Christmas was, it was still grace filled. Because even though that time was hard and even though it was different, there was something bigger than cancer going on there. There was still love. There was still togetherness. There was the kindness of medical professionals. So many of the hospital staff we got to know over that time and became like friends and, and, there, and so much we appreciated their kindness. There, were, there was something bigger than cancer going on at that moment. And I've learned through the years that being able to talk about that time is healing. That just being able to tell the story of that and to tell about those experiences is somehow is healing. I mean, as challenging as that time was, it's still good to discuss it. Something I think about telling a story is healing. That just being able to, to relate a story, to communicate it, to make sense in our minds and to share it with another, there's something about that process is, is healing, being able to talk about things. I've had, you know, through my years of ministry, I've prepared for few, many funerals with families. And part of that process is, is I usually like to meet with the family a few days before the funeral. And part of that is just to kind of work out some nuts and bolts, you know, what scripture verses they want read, are there hymns that you'd like us to sing, things like that. But I also do that as a way to listen to their stories. 
Because what they'll share about their loved one is so helpful to me in preparing and how I'll proclaim the gospel in that moment and, and, and being able to share particular particularities about their loved one. And so I'll often ask them to tell stories and remembrances and things. And there've been many times where it just, you know, I'm meeting with that family and, and the stories just start rolling and, and you know, story after story after story. And afterwards, many times the families said, well, thank you. This was so good to be able to tell these stories. Now, all I did was just kind of ask the question and then sit there with my notes and try to scribble down notes and to keep up with their storytelling. There wasn't a whole lot I did, but it was their storytelling that was healing for them. Now, these two that Jesus gives healing to, Jesus says, okay, don't tell anyone. Now, what's the first thing they do? <laughs> they immediately go and talk about it. Now, part of me reads that and thinks, well, what did you think they were going to do, Jesus? I mean, and there's maybe a lot of reasons why they would choose to go and, and disobey Jesus here. I mean, if something good happens to you, what do you want to do? You want to talk about it. You want to tell someone. I mean, think about the, the last time something really, really good happened to you. What, what do you want to do? You want, you want to tell people. You want to share that. And certainly they wanted to tell others. But I also wonder if they're telling the healing story is part of the healing itself. I wonder if, if they're sharing what Jesus has done, done for them is, is, is part of that healing, experiencing the healing as being able to talk about it. We're focusing this Sunday, as, as we focus on the season of healing, we're focusing upon mental health. Now, I find that there's a hesitance to talk about mental health. We've, uh, in my lifetime, I think we've come a long way where when I was a young person, that was something that was hush, hush, hush. And I think we're more open now these days, but it's still, I find there's a hesitance to talk about mental health. But mental health, is part of who we are, isn't it? It's not like this thing that's just separate from our physical health and we can neglect it. And it, no, no, I mean, mental health is, is a part of who we are, just as our bodies need tending. And if you neglect your physical health, you will suffer. In the same way, if you, you neglect your mental health, I mean, you will suffer. I mean, this it is part of who we are. We're not superheroes. You're not Superman. You're not Superwoman. I mean, wait, sometimes things are too much. Sometimes we get overwhelmed. Sometimes things are more than we can handle and our physical and our mental health suffers. But I've learned that just being able to talk about our challenges is healing in itself. Just being able to, to share with another what's happening in your life, to be able to tell the story of what you're experiencing is healing in itself. And I think that's why it's important to have good friends, people that we can talk to, friends that, that we want to be around and we love sharing with, who will listen to us and we'll listen to them. A, a conversation with a good friend is, is healing. I hope there's someone in your family that you can talk with and there's trust and there's love because being able to talk and to share among family members is, is so healing. Sometimes we need more than a good friend or family member though, a licensed professional, I regularly check in with the spiritual director uh, just to talk about how things are going in my life and to reflect upon my spiritual life. Being able to do that is so renewing and so good for me. You see, I think being able to tell our story and to reflect upon it as we tell it with another, that's important. It's healing for our mental health. And I believe that, that these two that Jesus heals, these two who are healed from blindness, that I think part of the reason they disregard what Jesus is saying is because telling about it uh, is part of the healing in itself. Now, people of God, I don't need you, I, you don't need me to tell you that we've been through a time here, haven't we? I mean, this, this last year has been a, a rough time for all of us in big ways and, and in small ways, but all of us have suffered through this time. And I've often thought about, here in this past year, I've, I've often wondered, I think, how will we talk about this time in years to come? How will we tell the story of this time in years to come? In five years, 10 years, 
20 years from now, how will we talk about it? What are the stories that we will tell? Will we talk about the time where we're a little more home-based, where we're not out and about the ways that we're used to, but we're, we were at home? Will we talk about the things that we missed, the things that we missed out on? I, a, a good friend of mine, his daughter graduated, her high school graduation was this last year. She was one of those kids who, who didn't have a normal high school graduation. Will, will we talk about those things, the, the things that we missed out on? But will we talk about, too, how we got through it? Will we talk about those conversations with family and friends? Will we tell the story of online church and how it was something we relied on in the season? We, in, in my household last May, we made donuts. I'd never made donuts at home before, but fried yeah, some donuts and, and they were good. Not as good as you get in a donut shop, but still they, they were good. I wonder if that's part of the story we'll tell of things that we did like that, that maybe we wouldn't normally have done, but because we were home-based, we, we chose to do them. How will we talk about this year? What will we talk about that helped us? Will we talk about our faith, our relationships, our hope that ultimately God is leading us to better things? What is the story you will tell? What's the story you need to tell? Well, here's my pastoral word to you. Tell your story. If there's a story you need to tell, then tell it. Part of our healing is being able to talk about it. And that might just be with a good friend and a conversation, a close family member. It might be with a professional who can help, help you and listen to your story. It might be somebody like a pastor. But part of the healing, I believe, is learning to talk about it. These two in the story, they couldn't help, they couldn't stop from talking about what Jesus did for them and maybe the talking about it was part of the healing. May we tell our healing stories too. Amen.